Right. Oh, now it's going to record me doing that. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm, now. I'm foolish. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Why is nobody coming in? It's too early. Yes, it is. I hope it's working. Makes me nervous. Oh, you're tech. You're a techie. What? I no, I don't think we. I think we're fine. I really do. Think we're fine. Yeah. Oh. We you know, watch this thing. Uh, no archives or anything. Well, you know what, Eric? Just I had him put the other day. Everything is all together on the uh, YouTube channel. So I wanted to send that out to everybody in the class, but I didn't want to do it in the same email with the Zoom link. Because okay. if you put two links in an email, that could lead to confusion. You know, they click on that thinking they're coming into this. So I'm going to leave this running and go get what I have for you, because otherwise I'll probably. Okay. They can't be sued. Giuliani? Yeah, he's filed a bankruptcy. Yeah, I heard. I guess it's. It means I don't have the money. I don't know. Get Luckily, online. I don't know that. Get online with all of my creditors, debtors. I'm going to go with you. Okay. okay. Now, just remember, this is running, Rabbi. So it's on. If I, I put for recording. I mean, I'm going to be back before anybody's going to need to come in. So I should have okay. finished. I can't say anything it? wrong. I hope I'm, yeah. Right. All right. Okay. I just hope I'm doing it. Well, I hope I'm not getting right. private class. Right. <laughs> I don't expect that. Lots of people last week.
Oh, I'm just a woman. I want to ask. Are you okay? Yes, I am. I was maybe exposed to somebody who may be oh, okay. not 100 percent I think I'm going to try doing this. Okay. Not yet. Okay. Oh, view. Yeah. That's the problem. Let's see now. Speaker. Why is the view changing? Gallery view. There's Not nobody else here. Rabbi, this is this uh, man. I'm going to Why are you putting him there? Yeah. I remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So my face well, okay, good luck. If okay. I forget them, you know, they, you know, they, they want that. Okay, I'm not going to do I'm going to just see if I can so, come sure. in. I don't know why it's so, nobody's coming in. So, might be well, weird. You got yeah. Wi-Fi? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that's why we're plugged in. We're no, fine. Have it on there, machine, so. But I'm just saying, why? Well, if we're plugged in, it should be. Speak. Uh, I don't think that's an issue. Oh, say no. So I take one. We have one. Oh. Oh, okay. oh no. I have, I've been giving them out. Okay, so sure. If I missed it. one, I gave it to Dahlia. <laughs> yeah, I gave it to you guys. No, I'm just saying to, um, to Doris <laughs> that I find that. It's easier for me to practice my Hebrew reading oh, from there because oh. it's bigger, yeah. You know, than sometimes the prayer book I find, or maybe prayer book just intimidating for me. Oh. But I find it's really mm -hmm. so when I do those and I do the Hebrew, I find it oh. easier for me. Mm -hmm. Very nicely printed. Yeah, it's yeah. very nicely printed. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This looks smaller to me when you got the prayer book. So that that oh, here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, well. Wow. It's working. No, I just uh I tested it by coming in myself so I can get in so other people just just so far nobody's coming in. Good corn. <laughs> These oh, reform Jews make a prayer book so difficult to use. Those silly reform Jews. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did you need from me? Sorry, oh, oh, I was going to ask. I mean, I know it's holiday time, even though it's not all holiday. Right. We have a few things here that aren't going to happen. Do you know if they'll be still doing the sandwiches on Sunday? Absolutely. At, Never miss a day. Period. Okay. Never I was interested. I, I'll just show up um, in helping. And I, I wrote it down, but, you know, I didn't want to come if maybe it wasn't. You know, it's helpful. You can just show up because it is because it's Eric that does it. And yeah. I know what he does. Well, it's helpful if he knows, because if like three extra oh. people show up, he may not have. Uh -huh. But but you can come try it. Come. Yeah, I'll just try it. And, yeah. you know, and then. If but you, you should you really would be helpful to be on his list because now and then he has to change the time. And that, yes. And the thing is, I don't know if I'm on his list, but, you know, if I show up and he'll be there, I can ask. OK, him. because I, if I'm he had to, possible. like, depending on what's happening in other rooms here, sometimes he has to make it earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah maybe later. All right. But that's great. So I know yeah. Dalia has been going. And, and I will yeah. tell you that we haven't missed a day. Okay. okay. Not during COVID. Not this is like one of my proud moments, but not during COVID, not during a hurricane. Okay. Never missed a Sunday. I okay. mean so people I were making during COVID, they were making sandwiches at home. Yeah, and, yeah. And meeting here with them. Yeah. But so it was good. Hi. Am I in your I can't believe nobody's zooming well, in. Sorry. But we'll still record. Where is everybody? She had, we should. I don't know. So, no, no, it's no, like it's not a set of rain, so I'm kind of. Yeah. Oh no! I'll juggle. It won't off. because you have your umbrella. Yeah, just in case. So we are being it's recorded. Only when I don't okay. bring it, then it rains. Just so you know, we've been being recorded. We are recorded. since you, yeah, because right. if um, I don't do it, then I'll forget to do it. Right. I think yeah. you yeah. did. You guys send you me the yes. Oh, I'm the wrong place. Okay. I did. Would well, you send me an email with that? Yes. Okay. I, if you wasn't going to add anything, it's fine, it's fine with me. It's, it's longer, but we just, we really felt like, 
this okay. one we wanted it to, so to say what happened. Here. I mean, so that, that one was the second day. It may not be as so much of a Hubbard thing as it is going to be a bunch of people meeting and then maybe forming a Yeah, it sounds like, well, the next couple of, as I said, I think what I'd like to do. Yeah, but you know what? I told you. Yeah, but it's an easy one. That is an easy one. You like that? But it's, yeah. And then everybody can socialize. It's not installable. I think that's a good one. All right. Like you said, you'll, yeah, you can look at it if there are things you don't like, you let me know. Oh, it's nice out. I thought, oh, I thought it was nice. No, I didn't think so. No, just me. I they checked it by coming in myself. There I am. Hi. Oh, you're going to, that's right. You sit here. They don't really I'm stand here. Well, but if you stand, stand there, they will be there. But you need to be facing the camera. I mean, I can turn it around. You can move the whole table. Oh, here. This is what we did. If you don't want to move the whole table. They move the whole table this way. Sure. Right. You know, oh, that's right. That's what we did. Yeah. Yeah. Move this thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, we had it. You're right. We had it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now move this. Okay. Okay. You just need to be prepared to let people in. Not sure. Uh, yeah. Here's the about the the embedding. Uh, no, there. Is there he is. The man, the myth, the legend. You need a theme song. Yeah, I That's great. That's it, Lynn. And you have to say the gallery. I'll come in from the theme song from Rocky. Temple Did Sword. I two different numbers? Yeah. 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 Oh, no, they're no stacks. Oh, my God. This is a huge yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk yeah. about yeah. it later. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually a very sad song about Vietnam, right? Oh, that was written in Vietnam. Vietnam. No, was it? No. It was was the, Vietnam. Let's see, I was in fourth grade and I sang it in a talent show. Yeah. So fourth grade it was 1964. Yeah, yeah I guess so. Yeah. Right. Wasn't that song? Okay, now I'm going to look up the origin. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, it could even be about any war. Yeah. Oh, yes, but that was written there. Yes. It's just like um, the Green Beret, right? But that also. The Green Beret. We have all the concerts today. The American best. <laughs> and speaking of concerts, if and you have a and then tie a yellow ribbon. Tie yeah. a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree. It's the same old ribbon. It's not the new version. Something old days. Judy says, I always make up my own song. I know. Oh, my goodness. You would grab by Barry. He's always making up songs. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I just make, no, I don't make, I make with my own Actually, words. Yeah, you make up your own words. Also, it's good. Actually, you know, yeah. his songs are very clever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's the, what's the song that, uh, I can't think I, I want to say who sang. At the very beginning. Where everybody in the audience goes, you know. What do they answer? Sean Rue. Yeah. And yeah. no, no, I'm sorry, it's not a Jewish show. Yeah, well, no, it's, no, it's, no, it's not that one. Anyway, the first time they did it, they answered him back in the song, because it was... Oh, I, I, Sweet Adeline. No, no, no. Oh, Sweet Caroline? Sweet Caroline. Sweet Caroline. Sweet Caroline. Oh, Adeline. And let's close. Caroline. So the first time the congregation, you know, did it, I went, what? <laughs> what and they what also what some kind of weird people well let there. me just say having attended many many of two services, people you're missing out here i've been led saying what <laughs> often well i'm sitting there and saying what two, two people before rabbi starts yes and the recording isn't on oh it's on it is on. we can't turn it off what night? Night? oh admit okay um, sorry rabbi barry um, really learned at the kneecaps of his father. Yes, he did. And so a lot of 
his rabbinic. Okay. There we um, go. We got people's voice. Where's Sue, though? There she is. His message. <laughs> I'm just going to kind of, I just want to know if people have to come in. No, cause Hello. Like, I got all my ladies. Yeah, my but didn't we read something in the book for this week a little bit well, about cosmic. it? About it's not cosmic Judaism. What was it? What was the word cosmic in that? It that used we cosmic. About? Yes, it did say cosmic. It did? Okay. okay. What is cosmic? That's not good. Well, well I can move back. It involves yeah. the natural yeah. environment. Yeah. That yeah. It's, it's no, no, I, why do I want to? So. He okay? uses I just as, need to, you know, well, it's like the mic. So like, we can't just look at it this way. We have to look at the whole universe or even the galaxies. Yeah, so it's a, it's different. All right, I have to I have to just say one thing. Yes. Um, I said to the rabbi, another rabbi, I said, uh, okay, um, you don't believe in God. Okay, so let me ask you a question. You're in the foxhole and you know you're going to die in a minute. Do you yell, big boom? Or do you yell, God? <laughs> no answer. Oh, well, I don't know if he doesn't believe in, in God. Uh, really? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. No, I, I don't believe that. Yeah, I don't think so. No. Well, that's the main message. The angel is we don't want to get too close to the rabbi. If that's what no. you're trying to do. Not joined. One. That was it for me. Okay. No, I think we're good. We're good. Agriculture yeah. in this oh, area. Yeah. Yeah. More condos. No more. No, he got. Well, there, there are more. I was thinking of the anti Semitic coalition. Yeah. Well, the anti Semitic coalition. The anti Semitic coalition. Please, Bob. It's not just not oh, against anti Semitic. Anti bias coalition. Oh, yeah. I know what I was thinking. Why can't we take survivors like we used to into the schools and have them meet a survivor and have, and talk about the Holocaust? Well, we might do that, but that's we haven't so we, have, we haven't gone to that stage yet. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that's they do it in a lot of ways. There that's are what, programs you know, to do that. Sure. There, there are programs, assuming that they do that. Yes, yes. we don't know. Our, that. our schools are mandated. We were the only state in the country mm -hmm. to have statewide legislation to do that. And the school boards fund teachers to go to conferences to learn the appropriate way to do it with eight to the students. But, yeah. but it makes a, quite a difference because I was reading about some students who had a Holocaust survivor in the classroom talking, and they they couldn't get over it. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, but they, they, but, they yeah. We had um, up north. We would have this program called the Ambassador Program, which brought together schools, which are all schools, of course, today are integrating. But schools primarily that are black, uh, are people, young men, young people of color, versus some schools that they weren't. All everyone was white, and it was a wonderful, wonderful program. And every year there was this. Uh, in, there were a couple of incredible Holocaust survivors that spoke, and these black kids just walked up to them and hugging them, and you know that. And it was a very, very powerful thing. Uh, but as I said in my sermon on Friday night, what is teaching and what is learning? And the example, of course, was that one boy who was arrested for putting a swastika. Up in the bathrooms of his of his high school, the day after he had gone through a whole day program on the Holocaust. So you can teach, but is it, what is teaching? And do they ever do they teach to make the jump from information to what does it mean today and for us? And that's what teaching is. Okay. Anyway, everyone, ladies, obviously, um, I think uh, Larry has gone to Bahamas or somewhere. Huh. Uh, and uh, Alan, I'm not sure if he's going to be here today. I don't know. He Harry? was here last night. I'm surprised. Yeah, we might be up last time a little bit late. Okay, so anyway, uh, we we join together with our blessing before study. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kedeshanu B'Mitzvotal V'Sivanu V'Asok V'Divrei Torah Amen. Okay, so so far I uh, I've been basically discussing the holidays, holy days, and all of that, and. As I said from the very beginning, as we looked at the Jewish calendar, the Hebrew calendar, is, is that an essential element of this is what is called time. Time is critical. And basically, our Jewish life is the sanctification of time. Uh, in that... Sorry, guys. That's okay. The commandment 
<laughs> There's a turnaround the other I want. Yeah, no, no, no. You know? I think it right. after this is probably gonna be it. Oh, let's see. Yeah, that that Lolita. Let's see. Yeah, there she is. Yeah. Hi, Lolita. Okay. Hi. Uh, and so time is uh time keep, continues. It's a continuum. I uh, and we as we are part of the infinite, uh, there is a dimension of timelessness. Obviously, uh, the concept of infinity has no beginning and no end, and certainly God has no beginning and no end. And yet, in our world of experience, what we end up doing is is focusing on time itself, like what time does this class begin, what time does it end, what am I going to do later tonight, unfortunately, whatever, we have a, at my community, Palm Chase, we have a monthly uh, clown show, which we call a community meeting with our board <laughs> at, at 7 o'clock, 7.30 tonight, mm -hmm. uh, so I have to be ready at 7.30 to make a report on the Jewish Heritage Club, whatever. And you have one with 10 next Yeah, night, yeah, so we got that. Okay, so therefore, but the thing is, is, is that our function in a Jewish way is not simply to say, well, uh, at three o'clock, I have uh, a class with all of you wonderful people. Uh, however, three o'clock also, I need to set aside some time to do mincha in order to mark the time as being what holy. Because when I do that, I'm taking the infinite and bringing it down into the finite. Again, if you were to think of the intersection of uh, the two triangles in the Magen David in the Jewish star, if the infinite is like this, then I need to bring the infinite down to this point in time. And then once I do that, and then I offer my afternoon prayer, I expand the infinite outward and then direct it up to Hashem, God, and I created a triangle, right? So that hopefully that. Okay, okay. Uh, and by the way, uh, if you see something that you're disturbed about, you know, people say, well, uh, they make the cross, right? We do the star, okay? Okay, I now I able to, so to Betty, oh. Betty, okay. <laughs> or go like this. It's, you know, they're too complicated. That's what we have to do that stuff. Zorro. Okay, forget about it. Yeah, Zorro. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and Betty, Zygazunt. Okay. Okay. So, anyway, Zygazunt to everybody. But the fact is, this is what we need to do. And so, as this week and, and, and two weeks from now, remember, we have no class next week. Uh, for those of you going to Tevye, for those not going to Tevye, well, do something else. Okay. Say Mincha, go pray during the afternoon. Yeah. Three yeah. Um, is the fact that we have life. A, a child is, a human is born, a human lives, however long or short it is, and a human dies. Um, and there are these, uh, I think it was, oh, God, I can't remember the name now. Anyway, uh, there are these markings along the road of life. Burma so, shaved. No, it's a, no. no. <laughs> a sociologist, an anthropologist, right, Lynn? Uh, what was that? Oh, uh, oh God, I can't remember the, the term. Uh, anyway, that we mark, we, we set up times of life to help us along the way, birth, high, going, beginning school, uh, adolescence, right. Right. getting married, rites of passage. Milestone. Yeah, yeah, who's the famous anthropologist? Margaret, not Margaret Mead. Me, no. Yeah, mm -hmm. Gail Sheehy? Yeah, maybe something like that, yeah. So anyway, these different parts in time. But we as Jews have to do something even greater than that. And that is we need to bring the infinite into these moments of time because we are B'nai Elohim, children of God. And so we simply don't say, oh, wonderful, a baby's born mazel tov. We have ceremonies to mark this. So let me begin by saying, first of all, that Judaism does believe in a soul. This is our connection with God. And there are five levels to the Jewish belief in the Jewish soul. They are called nefesh. N-E-F-E-S-H, Ruach, R-U-A-C-H, Neshama, N-E-S-H-A-M-A-H. Um, uh, and then there are two higher levels, uh, and we're not, I'm not even going to mention them because they are very, very high spiritual levels that most people do not ever, ever achieve or reach. But let's look at the Nefesh, Ruach, and the Neshama. There are many ways to interpret this, and you can look at a lot of these books, and it's a very, very involved uh, discussion. So to simplify it, I'll say the following. The nefesh occurs upon conception. 
So when that seed and that egg come together, that's when, yes, mm -hmm. life does begin. And that is when the nefesh begins its journey. However, Judaism does believe that a nefesh was in existence before that person is born. I'll talk about that a little bit next next week, about two weeks from now, uh, when I get into life after death, uh, beliefs in Judaism. Judaism does believe in reincarnation, but even with resurrection of the dead, the, neshat, the nefesh is in existence in a spiritual place before a person is born. The ruach means breath, or wind, but breath, so that we come into life by an inhalation. And the baby cries, and the, we all know it's not the baby in the back of the head. No, the back of the chest, I mean. Yeah, I saw too much of NCIS last night with Gibson. So, okay, okay, maybe, yeah. Uh, and anyway, um, is the in-breath, so we come into life with an inhalation. So then I'm going to talk about another subject to throw it in for the mix here. Then you might say, well, what is Judaism's view of abortion? And that was one of my sermons a couple of months ago, whenever it was. I've only been here more, a little bit more than a year, and I've forgotten what in the world I talked about already, which is good for me and good for you, because I can repeat myself. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, you know. Exactly. So all well, set. Fine for me. I can do the same sermon every week. Uh, but anyway, uh, is, is that Judaism does allow for abortion. Most definitely as long as, not as long as, because God forbid it should occur ever, but if the mother's life is at stake, the mother has the right to kill the fetus uh, in order to preserve her life because one has the right of self-defense under Jewish law. And so, yes, there is no denying. If, some, if you wouldn't get into discussion with someone about abortion, or I wouldn't suggest getting into people with discussions with people these days, but if you were to get into a discussion with someone and they would say, how is it that Judaism allows abortion? Yes, it does, because the, the, the fetus is considered to be what? A murderer is taking the, uh, taking the life of the mother and the mother has the right of self-defense. And then the Jewish law as described in the Talmud is, is that the mother is allowed to do that because she is a known being, okay? She has a life, maybe she's had other children, she has a possible, today's world, not necessarily, but assuming one has a husband, one has uh, a, a, a special other person, um, has relationships, whereas obviously the fetus hasn't even been born yet. And going back thousands of years, hundreds of years, the infant mortality rates were so very, very high, which is why uh, Jewish families had lots of kids. If you have, let's say, 10 children, you'd be lucky if two of them lived to adulthood because of disease and, and infant mortality and all that kind of stuff. So the fact is, is, is that abortion was allowed. For a matter of fact, the Talmud states that abortion is allowed until actually the head crowns or in the birth process comes out of the womb. Up until that point in time, you're allowed to abort if the mother's life is at stake. And, this, and if any Orthodox Jew says to you, no, that's not true, you can say that, no, they're wrong. It specifically says that. Where you get into the grayer areas, obviously, is beyond literally the mother will die if that fetus is born, other areas, such as if there's a, a case of rape, uh, or let us say, uh, today, of course, uh, there are amazing ways with the sonograms to, to, and, and, and uh, the various blood tests they can even do on a fetus and, and actually can see the uh, do uh, know the heart of the fetus. They, they actually do open heart surgery on a fetus these days and things. Absolutely amazing what they can do. Um, if, let us say, the child has some horrible, horrible disease, and there's no question the child will live one month uh, or six months or two years or whatever, uh, this is where it gets into gray areas. Most Orthodox rabbis would say no, only where the mother's life is at stake. Others, some even some Orthodox rabbis who are more liberal, certainly conservative, definitely reform rabbis, are more liberal in these areas. I can't imagine any rabbi, although I'm sure that there are, who would allow for abortion as contraception. Uh, and whereas there are, I hate to say young women, but they're young women who sleep around and they say, what's the difference that I get pregnant? I'll just abort and big deal. Well, it's, it should never be a big deal. And these things should be taken seriously. I'm not going to get into the whole presentation discussion 
uh, about uh, the burial of a fetus or if it's a stillborn, et cetera, and the different levels of time that go by, because it is a sacred life to be sure. The, and by the way, I'll throw this in as a freebie. The reason why, and this whole discussion in our country about abortion has, n well, people made it to be politics, okay? But it's not. The reason why it's pushed the way it is, is because in strict Christianity, they have to get that fetus, that baby born, even for one moment, even if it means the mother's going to die. Why? Because the mother's already been baptized, so therefore she will go to heaven if she dies. Whereas they got to get that fetus out in order to baptize it, in order so the fetus, if it dies in, in one second or five hours or whatever it is, it's going to go to heaven. And that's why this whole thing has nothing to do with politics. This is underlying push by Christianity to mix Christ, uh, religion and state mm -hmm. together, uh, which is, and hopefully all of you signed that petition. I read the article the other day, they're getting closer uh, to possibly getting it as a referendum ballot on the next election, which would be kind of a may maybe. It's getting closer. They said, I saw the statistics the other day. So, therefore, you come to understand that we do believe in the nefesh and the ruach, the minute the baby, the, the human being takes breath. So we immediately then have what? Rituals and ceremonies to what? Give thanks to God for birth. And uh, I'm looking around the room, I'm assuming maybe not, maybe it's wrong to say that all of you were mothers, at what, maybe all you, but there's always a mother. Um, but if you have children, God willing, uh, and you know, and you might remember, or maybe you don't want to remember uh, the birth situation. Um, I was, one woman told me uh, the reason why uh, she asked for drugs uh, to be knocked out when she had the birth of a child so that she wouldn't have to think about anything so she can have another kid. Uh, because many, some women say, if I could remember what I went through, I'd never have another child. Well, I, don't, I hope that, obviously that's not the case. Uh, when my mother told me she wanted drugs, she told me she wanted drugs, but she did have my sister. So thank you. Uh, however, the, the fact is, uh, is, is that birth is truly a moment of thanksgiving. Uh, and the birth of a child, I mean, certainly, as you all are aware, uh, it is miraculous. Uh, and even in the modern age today, uh, that that children, that fetus, that babies are born, they do die very quickly. Uh, there are terrible diseases. Uh, and how many are end up in a NICU unit, a neonatal unit, because the I, I've been involved with children who were born one pound, a pound and a half. And today, thank God, the things they can do is amazing. It's miraculous. And we thank God for that. So birth is a time of giving thanks. And we, of course, in Judaism, do this in a very special way. For the boy, yes. On the seventh day is the bris or the brit milah or circumcision. By the way, the word bris or brit I. Uh, one person said, oh, it's a brisket. No, it's not. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's not a brisket. Okay. A bris. Okay. Or the brit mila. Uh, is that the word brit does not mean circumcision. It means covenant. And therefore, the correct expression is brit or bris mila. The word mila means circumcision. It's the covenant of circumcision. And that's because, going back to Genesis, uh, it states very directly uh, that God said to Abraham, uh, as a symbol of your devotion to me, I'm going to ask you to cut off a part of your body, the foreskin, uh, as a sign of the covenant. If you remember way back, I discussed there were three covenants at the basic of Judaism, uh, the one between God and Noah, all human beings, between God and Abraham, and then God of the people of Israel with the Torah. And so... Abraham uh, did circumcise himself somehow or other, God knows. Uh, but uh, then, of course, his son Isaac was circumcised as well, and Ishmael was. And by the way, uh, Muslims male, Muslim males do circumcise as well. However, I've heard that they circumcise much later. Actually, one time I heard there's some group that circumcised at the age of 13. Oh, uh, that's real surgery, okay? It's not like the baby, okay? So on the eighth day, now you might say, why eight days? Someone said to me, well, obviously Jews are so smart. There are certain uh, uh, coagulating factors in the blood that don't begin to happen on the first or second day. It takes eight days for these things to activate and set in. I don't really know. But the bottom line is, 
an eight day is a full first week of life. And to me, basically what's happening is uh, by having the Brit Milah on the eighth day, the family is getting together and saying, thank God the baby has lived a week. And again, certainly in pre-modern times, living a whole week is a miracle, okay, to say the least. And certainly the mom would say definitely it's a miracle. I can get through a week already, okay. So uh, at the Brit Milah, uh, there, first of all, you don't have, a, have to have a minion. You don't have to have 10 men in the Orthodox community. Most people do. And, and some people make this a whole big deal. Other people keep it small. Uh, the, the bottom line is, is, is that there's always a debate uh, as to whether to have the, the circumcision at home on the eighth day and bring in a moil or do it in the hospital, usually these days on the second day of birth. Uh, I've been present uh, in a hospital on the second day for our circumcision. Uh, and I say the prayers over the baby to make it a brisk because circumcision is just the removal of the foreskin. The brief Mila is obviously saying prayers, welcoming the child into the people of Israel. So number, the other thing is, is the child Jewish if the child never has a circumcision? Yeah. Okay, why? Mother's, mother. mother's Jewish, right. Yeah. So for instance, if a child um, has uh, some kind of uh, hemophiliac or some kind of medical issue that cannot be circumcised, uh, that child is still Jewish. The, the, the circumcision, the brit milah, does not make that child Jewish. We are, we've discussed this already, we are born Jewish. Unlike Christianity, a child is not born, a person is not born a Christian, they must become a Christian by obviously baptism, okay, or confirmation, different rituals and different uh, communities of the, within the Christian group. Uh, and so that is something very, very important to understand. It does not make that child Jewish. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, this father up at North obviously called me up uh, and said to me, he'd like to meet with me before I was registering his son, uh, who was about 10 years old, I guess then, in our Hebrew school. So no one, no one ever called me about that. So I said, ah, sure. So, and by the way, I'll preface this by saying uh, that the, psych, the father was a psychoanalyst, which you know is a problem. <laughs> you know there's going to be a problem here. So the boy is with him, and we're now in the, my office there, uh, which is about an eighth of the size of this thing, uh, and uh, this beautiful office. Uh, and I said, well, why, what's the whole thing here? So he said, well, I just want to ask you, my son is not circumcised, and uh, I was hoping that she'd still bring him into the Hebrew school. Uh, they had gone to a conservative or orthodox school, and the rabbi said, no, if you're not circumcised, you can't be considered, because you're not, in the eyes of the Jewish community, you have to have that ritual. It is of essence for Jewish male, and they won't accept him as a student unless he gets circumcised. So how do I feel about that? I said, well, when we form Judaism, I mean, we don't require that, so we'll be glad to take your child in. But I said to him, well, but why is he not circumcised? Is that a medical issue? The father said, no. Um, I had read when when Jaime was born, it wasn't Jaime, <laughs> but when, when Jaime was born, I was into the psychoanalytic school of Otto Rank, the and Otto Rank believed that the creative energies of the male are in the foreskin. Oh. Uh, and so I did not want to remove that because I was hoping my son would be able to be a very creative person. So I said, myself, what could you? Okay, that's good. So I said, no problem, whatever. Okay, that's what you thought then. This is where you are now, 10 years old. So then the boy raises his hand and I said, yes. I mean, what's, your, what's going on here? Jaime said, Rabbi, for, for my bar mitzvah, I would like to become, obviously before the Lord, I would like to be circumcised. And oh, I said, really, you understand that that's going to be an actual operation and, and all that stuff. He said, oh, yes. So it shows you how the ch one's children can be smarter than their parents. <laughs> I said to the boy, well, why? And he said, because I'm tired of looking different than my father and my brother, because his brother was mm -hmm. before psychoanalyst uh, yeah. and, and, and how smart that is because yeah. any psychoanalyst and any therapist knows that boys do most often identify with their fathers uh, and especially in this area of the body definitely 
I, and he said, I'm tired of being different than the rest of my family. Unbelievable. So this is a way of identification. And actually, uh, if you go back to the 1800s and some of the discussions of the early uh, annals of the, uh, and, and the conventions of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, uh, which was the reform, rab which is the reform rabbinic, rabbinical organization to this very day. And they had big discussions about circumcision or not. Because just like today, there are many discussions about there are actually countries in Europe uh, that have banned circumcision of not just Jews, but anyone, because they feel it's, it's, it's too dangerous and it's not really helpful and all of these things. And the, the rabbis then discussed this and they said, even though we might not agree totally with it, and by the way, it's not unhealthy and not dangerous, obviously, is the fact that, that it is such a basic part of Judaism. We, even reform rabbis, cannot do away with it. Mm -hmm. So, what the eighth day at the ceremony? Have all of you been to a bris at some point or other? Okay. Um, as you know, you have the sand deck holding the baby down. Uh, and by the way, if it's done by, I don't know if any of you have been, when a doctor does it in the hospital, it's, it's really, I'm not going to say cruel, but they take the baby and they put the, they strap the baby down into a plastic mold that holds its legs apart and the baby is screaming. There's no wine to, to, to hopefully anesthetize the baby somewhat or get the baby drunk. Uh, and actually it does work. Even a little bit of wine on the baby's lips seems to work, I guess. Um, but the fact is, it is just the, the doctor and nurse and obviously this poor baby being strapped down in a cold plastic mold. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, of course, the baby's screaming. Uh, so to have a grandfather as the Sandek, loving grandfather is probably petrified to death about doing this to begin with, uh, but holding his grandson or down is, is, is I think, is more, more lovely in that way, more loving in that way. Uh, but again, uh, in terms of the celebration of life, Usually at the circumcision, uh, the, the bris, uh, is that the boy is given his Hebrew name. Of course, as you all know, Hebrew names can be either uh, named after someone who has passed away, which is the Ashkenazic um, custom, or the Sephardic custom to name after people who are living. But either way, it's the same deal. You're naming after the people from the past generations to bring them into the present and obviously into the what? into the future. But also the belief is that we are identified uh, by our soul. God knows us by our soul, and our soul is getting a Hebrew name. So for instance, my soul name is Shemuel ben, son of Yitzchak. My father's name is Isaac, in English, Ira. So my Hebrew name is Shemuel. God knows me by that name, for good, hopefully, God willing, okay, and all of us as well. Uh, however, uh, there was this couple once uh, who came to me, who was an inter-something inter couple, uh, in that she was Ashkenazic and he was Sephardic. And apparently both <laughs> sets of parents were screaming, yelling, fighting, oy, 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 as to one wanted to name the kid after someone who died, one after someone who's living, oy, they're fighting. I tell you. So they came to me and said, Rabbi, oy, this is like a fiddle on the roof stick. <laughs> what should we do? What should we do? And I said, name the child. The first name should be after someone who's living. The second name after someone who's died. And how do you feel? Oh, Rabbi, you're so smart. <laughs> and walked away from that, that uh, inter interaction. Very happy with me. I thought I was wonderful. Very easy to be a great rabbi. It doesn't make much. Very simple. Uh, so the naming is an important part of the circumcision. Now, what happens with the girl? Obviously, thank God, women are not circumcised. As you might know, that there are certain cultures in the world uh, that terribly do that kind of thing. However, we do not. Uh, and however, within the reform and conservative tradition and communities today, there are ceremonies to mark the eighth day for the girl as well. Uh, that would be called, there are various names such as Brit Simcha, the covenant of Simcha of joy, uh, Brit Chaim, the covenant of life, in which, again, there are prayers by which there's a celebration of the female's life as well. Is traditional Judaism a patriarchal and dom male dominated? Yes, we all know that. Uh, how, and so therefore you can explain, well, but keep in mind it, with the boy, it doesn't make the boy Jewish. So if the girl doesn't have a circumcision, 
It's not that she's not Jewish because of the Jewish the mother's Jewish, she's Jewish. These are simply ways of celebration and mocking the period, the time of life and sanctifying it and making it holy. The next mocking along the way is what's called a Pidyon Haben, P-I-D-Y-O-N, Haben, H-A-B-E-N. Uh, for a girl, we have Pidyon Habat, H-A-B-A-T. Now, under Orthodox, there's only a Pidyon Haben, the celebration of the redemp redemption of the firstborn son. In author traditional Judaism, a Pidyon Haben is done on the 30th day and it can only be done if there was a natural birth, because traditional Judaism, again, unfortunately, a woman who has to have a C-section should not be stigmatized and, and, and felt that she's not as good as a woman who gave natural birth. That's uh, terrible. But this, this ceremony in traditional Judaism basically alludes to that idea or, or hints at it. Uh, it must only be a natural birth because it's a giving of thanks to God on the 30th day that the child has now lived one month and thereby giving thanks to God that the woman uh, has functioned properly and normally and therefore can give have other children like 10 or 12 God has, okay? Um, and after that, I'll never forget, many decades ago, uh, there was the front page of the Miami Herald and there was this Orthodox woman, um, you could tell she was, and there were 12 girls alongside of her. Yeah. And these were 12 single births. Mm -hmm. She was the mother of all of them. And the headline said, she's not stopping. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> she was gonna keep on having babies until she got a boy yeah. or until she, her, 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 her baby making system mm -hmm. just gave up and said, enough of this, leave me alone. Mm -hmm. I can't stand this. But, well, but why? Yeah. Why, why does she need a male? The expectation of Orthodox men was they will have a son. But why? Carry on. on. Well, carry on. But also to say Kaddish. Mm -hmm. In traditional yeah. Judaism, well, a female to... cannot say Kaddish yeah. for a parent. Mm -hmm. You need a male to say Kaddish for you. Mm -hmm. That poor woman. She was smiling, I must say, for the photograph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She had no choice. It's well single for us. Oh. No, pretty well. Explain that one no, there. Right. Yeah. I'm looking at the. Isaac the Shabbat singer. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. So anyway, uh, yes. Question in Yevim. No. Oh. But that's not for all the tribes. Well, yes. Well, I'll go back. Uh, yes and whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind of answering multiple questions in my own head right now about the yes and no. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, the way the ceremony works, I'll describe that first, then I can answer your question. Uh, is in the Torah. It states that the firstborn child is given to the to God, not killing it, thank God, uh, but rather doing what? Giving it to the Holy Temple in Jerusalem to serve in the Holy Temple. But there is a way of not doing that. And that is you have a redeeming of the child back to the parents by bringing, going to the Kohen, the high priest of ancient Israel, giving the Kohen, let's say, five shekels, and then you are symbolically buying back that child to the family. Fundraising. Uh, yeah. Fundraising. And so that is the tradition. Hey. And that is, uh, you at a Pidyon Haben ceremony, I don't know if you've ever been to it, uh -huh. is that you have the Kohen, find a Kohen, and then you give him $5, he's holding your baby, and there's a certain ritual and, and prayers and whatnot and, and words that are said, going back thousands of years, and then you take your baby back. It is now, again, once again, it is yours. Uh, and first of all, as Sheila was asking, if the, if the either parent is already a Kohen or a Levite, obviously you can't buy it back from yourself, so you don't have to have the ceremony. You don't have the ceremony. In Reform and Conservative, if one wanted to, again, mock the 30th day of life, which is worthy of being mocked as being and recognized as being holy and special, you can have a pigeon haben for any, whether it's a natural birth or not, as well as for a girl and have a Pidyon Habat ceremony, not in Orthodox Judaism. Okay. Moving along in time, there is what's called consecration. Consecration is certainly not in Orthodox, but in, in Reform, conservative some places, is that it simply is a prayer of thanksgiving that the child is now ready to start Hebrew school. Uh, and there's a special prayer, sometimes it's a Simchas Torah, 
at different holidays of the year and worthy of a celebration. Moving further in time, you have Bar and Bat Mitzvah. Bar Mitzvah, uh, no one really knows when the first Bar Mitzvah occurred, okay? However, a Bar Mitzvah, the word Bar means son of, the Mitzvah of commandment, and it is designated going back into the Talmudic period that it was at the age of 13. That was considered to be the age of adulthood. But why? Most people did not live beyond the age of maybe 30 or 35. This makes everyone you feel much older, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, obviously, in those days, uh, they didn't have the, the know-how that we have today medically and otherwise uh, to keep people going many, many year, years and decades. So by the age of 13, you really needed to get married. And thank God, biologically, at the age of 13, a male and a female are able to have children. And therefore, you are considered to be of the eligible level to have a bar and bat mitzvah. A girl could be, in all traditional Judaism, there is no such thing as a bat mitzvah. But obviously, in Reform and Conservative, there is. Orthodox finagled this thing. Basically, they almost make it like a, a sweet 16 party at 13. Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes when I sometimes when I'm back on Long Island, I'll go to the, the Hampton Synagogue, which is modern Orthodox, and I was really they will not allow a woman on the bima. Okay, she's not allowed to be up there, even to hold the Torah. Nothing. Okay. However, when the, the assistant rabbi Avram Bronstein, who's a very wonderful man, he's really a, a very very bright. I uh, uh, his, his father is the dean of Yeshiva University's uh, rabbinical academy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very bright family. But anyway, uh, is is that uh, it was the time for his daughter's bat mitzvah. She was 12 years old. Uh, and I was totally amazed. They actually, after the service was over, of course, they then invited her up to give a speech. And that was a bat mitzvah. Okay. I'm sure they had a nice Hamptons party. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, it was also until two years ago that they didn't invite female cantors to join the cantor on the Duma, and they did, I think it was two years ago, at the end of COVID. Oh, at the yeah. synagogue? Yeah. Oh, yeah, but that was thanks to, that's thanks to Nathaniel Hurston, mm -hmm. who told me about that, mm -hmm. and he got a lot of flack for that. And he did another concert a few weeks ago with a female Down here? cantor. No, there. still in Hampton. Yeah. <laughs> I can never That's open it. Not oh God. You always do it. Mm. Wash your hands. I'm not touching where you're. Oh. Gonna... <laughs> God oh. forbid. Okay, so Earth anyway. Watching. Any questions so far? Okay, so at the, you have a bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah, uh, and obviously, and not to go into all of this, but it should be, you know, it, it really. Is a passage, it's a passage of time, uh, and you're celebrating the fact that a child is now an adolescent. Uh, I always feel this is kind of like the, the Jewish TV show Survivor. You take this poor kid, 13 or 12 years old, and by the way, why 12 for girls in conservative Judaism? In Reform, girls should be 13 also, we're all equal, why not? In conservative, it's 12. I think it goes back to that Boba Misa ladies that my mother always said, your sister's more mature than you are. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's always, girls are always more mature than boys. Right? That's part of the feminist diatribe that makes us feel more insecure than we are already. Oh. Which is why men are so messed up. Right? <laughs> yes, we are so screwed. Part of the expression so screwed. Most men. Okay. Uh, anyway, is, is that... We want to, of course, not emphasize the party. Uh, there was one uh, parent uh, who actually, in order to afford the bar mitzvah that grandma and grandpa thought they should have, actually uh, took out a loan, uh, took out a loan against his mortgage, and actually canceled uh, his insurance policy, like his medical oh insurance God. policy, oh, uh, and ended up having a heart attack anyway. He got a stress. Uh, I mean, what does it mean? I'm going to tell you that. Okay. I have a question. Yes. The first time a young boy is called to the Torah and is able to say the Torah blessing appropriately has been referred to as becoming a garment. Mm -hmm. Is that Talmudic? 
I'm going to guess. I'm going to say yes, but I can't substantiate it. Right? Too close. Yeah. Oftentimes, there have been children who are different learners, mm -hmm. and through the process of trying to educate, it becomes clear that either she or he mm -hmm. is not capable of doing what has become the traditional well, bar mitzvah. Yeah. But he can learn to well, respect what, the Torah blessing as someone else's. Well, that's what we Torah. have to, we have to believe certainly it has to be shaped to the child. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly we in this temple and most reformed synagogues, probably you all and, definitely we have that li that leeway to be able to shape it to that child. I mean, I had one one child. She was uh, unfortunately very, very, uh, what's the right word? Impaired, uh, impaired mm -hmm. um, mentally, you know, and all that. Uh, and uh, she said the blessings over the Torah in transliteration that we all scream Mazel Tov. Mm -hmm. She never read anything from the Torah at all. Mm -hmm. we're, we're pleased that she was able to stand up there, right? She wanted to make it a meaningful experience, mm -hmm. you know, for the child as well as obviously for the family. But what about that third level of the soul? See, I'm going back to that now, the neshama. Whether the sh at some point in time, some some of the sources said at the time of the bar mitzvah, one develops a neshama part, which is our higher intellectual capacities, our moral and ethical impulses. Uh, I I know I've heard uh, that actually a young adult doesn't really become development developing those parts of the body, the the, the human. Uh, until probably the 20s or 30s. Uh, but the fact is we begin to develop our more ethical and moral sense, hopefully sometime in our adolescence or our growing up period. Uh, some people do this, obtain this differently, but we therefore add the third level of the soul, which is the neshama. And so the child gets married. Uh, I'm sorry, the child is growing up now, uh, and we're now moving to the stage of getting married. If you were to go back into the Torah, into the Bible, and look at the uh, ritual of marriage, you would not find any ceremony or ritual of marriage at all in the Torah. People obviously had a relationship of marriage, but on the other hand, keep in mind that polygamy was allowed in the Bible, so that Abraham had many wives. They all did, okay? They had a harem, so to speak. And why? Because the purpose of marriage was for one purpose only, and that was what? Having children. And why? Because the more children you had, the more little slaves you had to work on the fields and take care of the flock. Ideally, that'd be nice if it worked that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's why you had lots of kids, because then you had a, a, a group to work with the family, whatever the family's occupation was. And in biblical times, most often it had something to do with farming or agriculture. And so you needed a lot of workers, so you have a lot of children. And so love really had very, very little to do with it. And we have almost, we actually have no record of a ceremony of marriage in the Torah or in the Bible. However, in the Mishnah and in the Talmud, you begin to have the development of a ceremony. And the ceremony actually has two parts to it. The first is called Nisuin, which means engagement. And then the next level is called Kedushin, which is marriage. And there was a year's period of time between the moment when a couple gets engaged, Nisuin, a year's period of time in order to get the groom, give the groom a time to go out, build a home, uh, secure an occupation in order to repair the whole setting uh, for his bride-to-be. And then you have Kedushin a year later. What ended up happening was is that going now moving forward in time in terms of the Middle Ages, let us say, when times were so very difficult for the Jewish people, and unfortunately many couples would get married and not live to get, even live uh, for a full year's period of time where they get killed by the Cossacks or some, some other group who hates us, Hamas, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, and so therefore, the rabbis telescoped the two ceremonies into one event. Mm -hmm. So that in conservative, orthodox, and also in most, in reform, definitely in most Orthodox communities today, uh, is that they bring together both ceremonies at the same time. So for those of you who have gone to an Orthodox or conservative ceremony, 
you might have noticed that there's actually two, uh, you might not have, because you might have been not been in the room where the documents are signed. There are two documents. There is what's called tenayim, which means conditions for marriage that, rep that are signed for the engagement part. And then there is the ketuba for the uh, kedushin or the marriage part, okay? Um, and you have witnesses for these things, and there are various kinds of ceremonies for them at the marriage ceremony. Reform Judaism once went one step further and said, look, almost every couple today, modern times, is engaged way before they get married, okay? Uh, and by the way, as you're probably aware, if you've seen any of these movies like Schissel and Schissel and these movies on Netflix and all, is that in very ultra-Orthodox communities, they still have arranged marriages to this very day. But whereas, certainly in a modern context, uh, we don't have arranged marriages, certainly, and most couples are certainly not engaged in the same night that they're married, uh, unless they happen to meet in Reno or Las Vegas, and they get married, they get engaged, they meet, they get engaged, they get married, and the next day, oh, who is that? Let's get divorced. Okay. Yeah, drive -throughs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, if any of you who are still married here in the room and you want to get married in the Elvis Chapel in Vegas, I will definitely go with you. I will, that is one of my life's goals to dress up as an Elvis uniform. Oh, Elvis. Costume I thought you said the Elvis Chapel. Oh, like that's that. right. My brother and his oh, wife got married in Las Vegas by Elvis. Yeah, I heard that. Well, I want to be the Elvis and I want to sing Love Me Tender. Un unbelievable. No wonder I they didn't tell anybody. Yeah. There is part or maybe a full verse in Genesis Genesis that has been referred to, interpreted, commented upon. I can't remember where in the beginning of Genesis. When a man leaves his father, not his mother, but I believe it's only his father, and moves on to right. the next phase of his life. And it's referred to as the first marriage comment yeah. in Genesis. Yeah. I can't remember exactly yeah. where it is. But that's all it says. We don't know anything else. Yeah. yeah. When when the man is permitted to leave his father or when the man determines to leave his, the home of his father and by the way his mother also. Right. But but that was what I recall reading right. a long time. But, but again we don't have any description description yeah. of any ceremony. I mean, obviously, in most cultures, most times, there was something. You went to a holy man, whatever it was, mm -hmm. but we don't have any description of anything until later on. And, of course, you know, the dates of these things, the Mishnah, and, and certainly the Talmud, where there's a great discussion about a lot of these things. So that gives you a sense of the order of how things went from engagement, marriage, uh, two separate ceremonies on the same night, and then bringing them together into simply one ceremony, in Reform Judaism. So that, for instance, a, a wedding that I do, unless the couple requests it, I've done a couple of ceremonies where they want to have the two documents and the whole thing. There is also a custom within the traditional ceremony called Bidekin. True. And that is where the bride is not even seen until that night, and she's wearing a veil, and her parents bit the veil up, and the and the bride, the groom-to-be, looks at her and identifies her. That goes into, is related to the biblical experience of poor Jacob, uh, who ends up marrying the older sister Leah, not Rachel. Uh, and so therefore you want to ma make sure that you're married to the proper girl. So the no, ceremony of the Deccan to look, and because the Deccan means to examine and to make sure that it is her. What's very interesting is in the development of the marriage ceremony in particular, and there's a marvelous book, unfortunately, it's out of print now. It's called Magic and Jewish Magic and Jewish Superstition by uh, Trachtenberg. Uh, Joshua Trachtenberg. It's a great book, but it's out of print. I think we have it in the library. Yeah, of course, we have everything. Yeah, of course. Between this yeah. library and that library, yeah. Anyway, if you want to have a read through it, uh, Judaism is filled with superstitions or bubamices, if you want to call them that, or folk customs and beliefs. During the Middle Ages, certainly, and prior to modern times, is that there's no question that there was a belief in what we call them evil spirits, ruchot, or good spirits. All the time. They are everywhere. They're here right now. Okay? 
and they were, and the beauty of our religious tradition or all religions is they give people the tools to be able to fight against the evil spirits. Now you might say to yourself, Rabbi, get over this. I don't believe in it. I don't believe in it. Yeah. <laughs> is that the front door or the back door? That's a joke. Okay. So anyway, um, is that we, there are many things in our lives that we don't want. I don't, we don't want cancer. Uh, we don't want heart disease. We don't want Alzheimer's. We don't want dementia. Uh, we don't want uh, our stock portfolio to go down the toilet. Okay, mm -hmm. we made the wrong decisions uh, either on our own with uh, with a lack of help from a financial advisor. Okay, these are things that we don't want. We don't want accidents, right? But guess what? Stuff happens to us and we call them accidents. We call it cancer. We call it heart disease. We're just giving them names. So hundreds of years ago, they gave names evil. They called they didn't know cancer. They called it evil spirits, and they called it heart disease. They didn't call it heart disease. They called it another name evil spirit. And there was this and there was this angel Samael, the angel, the tempting angel, the angel of evil, who's always trying to mess us up. Because you say to yourself, "Boy, why did I do that stupid thing? Why, why am I so why am I so dumb?" And and you say, well, what, "Where'd that come from?" Well, they would say it was Samael trying to trick you to mess you up. Uh, so that Judy would uh, say to you, why'd you do that? Okay. Oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. <laughs> so, so the fact is, they had these beliefs. We have belief. We think we're all so fancy-pantsy, right? That we have, oh, cancer. We, have, we think we have a better thing on them. As, of course, we know, unfortunately, all too much. In most of life, we have no control over anything. And we're trying the best we can as modern humans to deal with all of these things. But unfortunately... And especially we've experienced this in this temple in the congregational family. There are so many things that just happen to us, no matter our best efforts. Okay, um, not speaking about anyone particularly here. Uh, we had a very dear friend. This is now 15 years ago, I guess, up north, who had esophageal cancer, uh, and she was in Sloan Kettering for almost a year and a half, maybe less one month, mm -hmm. because no matter what they did for her, everything got messed up and got wrong, and she died. And at the end, she got a bill, a family, the cost of the year and a half of Sloan Kettering intensive care was $16 million bill, oh, medical bill. My God. She, her family actually went, maxed out on three medical plans mm -hmm. and the end of the hospital, of course, just forgave her for what was left over. Mm -hmm. But well, the fact like is, the, uh, yeah, well, the fact <laughs> is you like to think, if you, aside from anything she's went through, the poor, her name was Tracy Dixon, she's rest in peace. Aside from what she went through, you'd like to think, hey, I'm spending $16 million I should get, I should live, but guess what? It doesn't work out sometimes. Well, or whatever. Go with the, um, um, people make plans, you all live. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the fact is, we want to be happy. We want joy in life. We want things to go well, right? That's what shalom means. We want a balance in our lives where everything is is nice. And so take, for instance, this couple now that I've been describing that's going to get married. The wed the marriage couple is a very is in a very vulnerable position because why in Judaism particularly from that couple comes the future because they're gonna have children and that's the future of the Jewish people. And so Judaism has furnished at the wedding ceremony all of the tools to be able to the best of the ability of God and Judaism and tradition to ensure the fact that the, that couple is going to live and be well and have a long life and have many kids and do the best we can. So the marriage ceremony is filled with these superstitions mm -hmm. slash bubamices or simply cultural or cu cultural uh, ceremonies, cult folk customs, that's what I was thinking. So let's start from the very beginning. Why does a bride wear a veil? A veil because it hides her beautiful face from evil spirits who are flying around at the ceremony because they want to, they love to find beautiful people and make them unbeautiful, make them miserable. So she wears a veil. Of course, today we don't do that anymore. When they used to throw rice at a couple when the, when you walked out of the 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 the, the, um, the synagogue or wherever the catering facility, why? Because you while well, you're throwing the whatever it is, the evil spirits are flying around and they love to eat this stuff. But you might say, well, you don't see any evil spirits eating anything in the air, but they are there and eating the spiritual everything. By the way, under Kabbalah. 
we have a multiple, a, a infinite number of four dimensions in which we are living in at all times. Everything you are, we are doing here, I'm speaking, you're sitting here very nicely and listening in this room. Everything here is exactly the same in another dimension, okay? This is the world of Asiya, the next level up, which is the world of Yusira. Everything here is that when I go like this, in a spiritual dimension, I have a spiritual form that is my arm is going up in the spiritual realm. And so therefore, there are spiritual rice, there's physical rice in the world of Asiya, this dimension, and then the, in the world of Yetzirah, there's spiritual rice. And the spiritual, the spirits, we can't see them. Okay. Lock them up, lock them up. Okay. Uh, lock them up. Some can't see. Can see. Can see. Can see. Yeah. Okay. So therefore, you throw rice at the wedding ceremony. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, during the wedding ceremony, going back into the Middle Ages, <clears throat> the groom would drink wine <clears throat> for Kiddush, okay? He would then take whatever wine was still left in the Kiddush cup, and he would then pour it all over on the ground, and then he would also break the glass at the same time. All those different rituals are to keep away the evil spirits. Why? Evil spirits love wine. Some of them are real shikas. <laughs> so they want to drink the wine. Get rid of them. Get them drunk. They'll leave me alone. You I break the glass. What? I do what that was to her. I had heard that he breaks the glass to recall the destruction of the temple. Okay, good. Okay, let's. I'll get there in a second. And then to break the glass cause, wow, they get scared away. <laughs> However, the rabbis were very concerned about these rituals because they were different. You don't, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm basically, uh, what should I say, getting myself out of a job here. Uh, however, you do not need a rabbi to officiate at a wedding except to sign the marriage license for the state of Florida, okay? Mm -hmm. Anyone can, any two, all you need is two people and two kosher witnesses and you got a marriage ceremony, mm -hmm. assuming that they know the rituals and, this, and the whole business. Today, you have professionals like myself who know how to do the whole thing. And so we, have, we are officiants at the ceremony. But actually, we're totally unnecessary. So that going back to the Middle Ages, the rap people were doing these things. They were breaking glasses. They were pouring wine in the ground. They were doing all these things. And the rabbis became very concerned about this because these are bubamices. And what you end up happening, if you have faith in God, then you don't need all this stuff. You don't have to do all this stuff to protect the couple. God will watch over the couple. And that's, and, and there's no, just say the right prayers in the ceremony and they'll be protected and they'll be fine. <clears throat> so the rabbis then, Lila, separated all these things out. So you have the Kiddush, Kiddush, in the middle of the ceremony and they separated from the breaking of the glass. They were very concerned about the bringing of these two things together, associating them again with evil spirits. And first of all, no more pouring the wine on the floor either. And there's some rituals where actually they pour the wine over the left shoulder facing the north side because the north side is the side of evil and the left side is the, the evil side of, of all human existence. Don't worry, there's nothing left in his writings. <clears throat> so, they are, so they put it then, the breaking of the glass to the end of the ceremony. But Lila, they then had a big problem. They had to then explain what the breaking of the glass was all about. They couldn't say, well, we're breaking the glass to keep away the evil spirits because no one would believe it. And then you're feeding back into the ritual. So some rabbi, I don't know who it was, said, oh, we're breaking the glass to remind us of the destruction of the walls of the temple in Jerusalem. Let me ask you, Lila, you were married, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you had a Jewish ceremony? Yes. Did you, in your wildest thoughts at I that- I had to get also with the church. Oh, oh, okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> in, in your wildest dreams <laughs> at your home. wedding ceremony, <laughs> did you ever think about the temple in Jerusalem and the walls being broken? No. Nah. <laughs> oh. Who thinks about those things? But they put that in to get people not thinking about evil spirits. Because I didn't really, think about them either. Yeah. Well, you, well, you know, yeah. you didn't. We, everyone else did there. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, you know what I'm trying to say. They throw that, that thing about the breaking of the walls to distract the, the audience and the couple from thinking about the real meaning. And by the way, in my wedding ceremony and my affirmation ceremonies, mm -hmm. I say the following, as you step upon, as you break this glass, 
May the two of you together as a couple in love always shatter any problems that might come your way. May they be few so that you live together a long and wonderful life. Excellent. Notice my key word there. Troubles, problems, mm -hmm. ah, evil spirits. But I don't say that. Because that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because, I don't know, Sheila, you believe in evil spirits and stuff? Yeah. Or do you? You never know. <laughs> what about going around seven times? Okay, we'll get to yeah. that. Again, that's another book. That's another one of those folk customs. There was a rabbi uh, in the Talmud whose name is Kony, the circle drawer. And he was known for drawing magic circles because you can remember, you can have a, how many of you remember the guard doll commercial, the protective shield that protected your teeth? Yeah. Russia yeah. be the guard doll, whatever it was, Pepsi and something, and protect the sh shield on your teeth so you won't get cavities. Ah, oh, give me a break. Okay, I have so many cavities in my mouth, it's ridiculous. Okay, um, but I brushed my teeth and I was trying to be good. So the fact is, is that by drawing this a circle around a person and saying certain words or incantations, this is a very typical thing of many religious traditions and cultures, not just Jews. And why seven times? Because seven is believed to be a lucky number. In ancient times, they only knew of seven planets, including the Earth and the Moon, which the Moon was considered to be a planet, and the Sun. So they only knew of four other planets, okay? And therefore, seven was considered to be a lucky number because there was a very, very strong belief in the Talmudic period of what? Astrology and the influence of the planets upon human existence. Very strong. So therefore, seven times around, and the bride, according to, and this is all in Trachtenberg's book, uh, the bride is protecting her groom. And why? Because a sorcerer might try to kill the groom in order to steal the beautiful bride. And so she has to protect him from the sorcerer. Also, another, whatever you want to call it, you're supposed to, at the end of the ceremony, when the glass is broken, you're supposed to take the glass that was broken at the wedding ceremony and keep it. And I actually still have ours in the napkin uh, and my, and I, my, my amwa drawer uh, up north. I have to remember someday when we sell that place to bring it down here. Uh, so I, and why? Because another tradition is if a sorcerer gets a hold of the glass that you broke at your wedding, he can cast a spell on you. <laughs> okay. So, no, yes, Lila. Okay. Uh, related to that, we said I had, I had to get it from my first name. Why do they go around seven times? But the opposite direction for that, uh, and you ha uh, get divorced. What? Wow. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know. I heard that. Oh, really? The same rabbi that married it. Oh, it maybe you're undoing it. Orthodox. Oh. Uh, and they made me go maybe. down seven so times. So maybe I'm... Maybe the I'm, opposite direction. Oh, oh, well, maybe I'm doing it. Okay, maybe yeah, I'm yeah. Doing. yeah. That's what I find. Now, under Jewish law, uh, divorce, unlike Catholicism, divorce is allowed. And actually, the Torah itself, it doesn't talk about getting married, but it talks about getting unmarried, Okay. Uh, and there is certain, uh, what should I say, requirements for, for in the Torah for a male only can give a divorce. Mm -hmm. A woman cannot issue, uh, instigate or start a divorce in traditional Judaism up until modern times. And these days, today, she can. But certainly traditionally, she cannot. Now, what is the whole bit about a get? You might say, well, I went to a lawyer, I spent a lot of money, and I got a regular civil divorce. In the traditional community, you must get a get, or we or give a get, uh, which is the proper way to do things. In traditional Judaism, the man gives the get, and Lila is describing it a little bit, uh, and the get uh, is a document uh, which does what? Uh, it states, uh, the it's basically an agreement by the couple that the relationship is dissolved. Now, it's very interesting, under Jewish law, if a man does not give a get to his wife, the punishment for not giving the get in traditional Judaism is not on the man, it's on the woman. Because if the woman remarries and she has children with another man, uh, oh, Betty, so keep some bopping in and out. Oh, is she? Oh. So, 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 uh, uh, and marries another mm -hmm. man and has children of this another man. Mm -hmm. Those children will be considered to be mamsers or bastards under Jewish law. 
So what it does is traditional Jewish law, by the way, we formalize none of this, okay? Mm -hmm. However, in traditional Jewish law, uh, is that it puts the punishment, therefore, upon one's children not to get a gift. So you'd like to think that most men would want to do it the right way. Uh, however, there are some men who don't do it, and they really make their wives miserable. Uh, and actually, today, a woman can go in most states uh, to actually a, a civil court, uh, and, this, and the judge would require a get, and can actually force, or take, actually, uh, I don't know if it's a jailable offense, uh, but certainly is one punishment by certain fines not to give a get. We had an incident about four years ago in our community in which the man refused to uh, provide a get for his former wife. And this went on for a few years. And here were several members of the modern Orthodox congregation that tried to cancel him to let go and allow her to move on. Uh -huh. And there was actually um, a civic social demonstration here on Lake Ida Road in front of the uh -huh. dental office uh -huh. that uh -huh. a couple of good. us attended. Did he, did he finally get in? Yes. Oh, good. Wow. What's interesting is about the concept of being a bastard. Let us say if uh, two people had obviously intercourse, and they have a child, but they're not married to each other. That child is not a bastard under traditional Jewish law. That person is an Israelite, just uh, depending upon what the father is, a Kohen, a Levite, or an Israelite, but is not a bastard. A bastard under Jewish law is the child of certain forbidden relationships. For example, a person who, a man who is a Kohen, the descendants of the priest of ancient Israel, cannot marry a divorcee. If he marries a divorcee and they have children, that's a forbidden relationship because the Kohen under ancient law must be only with a pure woman. And a divorcee, sorry, any divorcees here, is not considered to be a pure woman. And so she's tainted. Ugh. Okay, so anyway, uh, also if he, ha if, he, if he marries a woman who's an orphan, uh, the same, there are certain categories that the Talmud goes into descriptions about this, then the child is a bastard under Jewish law. And the same thing is, if a woman does not get a get, but she marries another man, the marriage, first of all, is not even recognized under Jewish law, but she has children, those children are mamzerim or bastards. How, and according to the curse, bastards can only marry other bastards for 10 generations. Oh, so that there are actually, in Borough Park and in Mea Sharim, the Orthodox community in Jerusalem, there are actually communities of mamzerim in which they can only marry each other, period. However, there's a way of getting out of the state of being a bastard. Mm -hmm. By the way, now you know you can call someone, hey, you moms are, they won't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Mostly, aren't they? Unless they're Jewish, they, they don't say that. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, but you can see it's a very technical, actual technical term. The way you can get out of being a momser or a momser a woman is that you would convert to another religion and then reconvert back into Judaism oh, okay. and then you're an Israelite and you're okay. That, that could, you know. So you can imagine these rabbis in the Talmud sat around all day long, all night long, thinking of these things. Okay. I have a, a question. So when I was reading um, the um, Ketubah, right. oh, you know, yeah. uh, I was a witness to my sister-in-law's Ketubah, but according to what I was reading, I, I'm a relation. I should never Correct. have been. Correct. I should never okay, have now, signed. Okay, it. so now let me go back now and say the following. Mm -hmm. There are three things that must be met in order for a marriage ceremony to be considered to be kosher. Uh, I'll get to the ketub in a moment. One of them is a kopa. You must have the bridal canopy, the wedding canopy over. Mm -hmm. uh, there are no specifications as far as I know as to the size of a chuppah, etc., but it must be over the couple. And the reason it represents and symbolizes the couple in their new home uh, that is to be established, obviously. It also represents God's blessings like the sukkah of peace, the God, the tabernacle of peace, God watching over and protecting the couple. So you must have a chuppah. The other is there must be a transference of money in traditional Judaism, from the groom to the bride, you will never, ever see an Orthodox group, uh, uh, husband wearing a wedding ring. He doesn't have to have a wedding. He doesn't have a wedding. He never has a wedding ring. 
only the bride. And therefore, what he does is he must give a transfer, a gift of a monetary value to his bride with the ring. This is also why in traditional Judaism, the ring must be of no diamonds on it, no jewels, and must be simply gold, or flat, whatever it is, but it must be a plain wedding band. And why? Because diamonds, let us say, have um, more of a, um, uh, you know, based upon the, the worth of the diamond at this any given time, it is more difficult to determine the true value of a diamond. Whereas if I could, I can't take this thing off, but if I could get it off, I'd put it on a scale and based upon the value of gold at that moment in time, you know what it's worth. So what does the bride give to her husband-to-be? She brings her dowry. Obviously in pre-modern times, it was the Afghan that she was knitting and it was the goats and the sheep and the whatever that she brings to it, okay? In a sense, Jews created the prenuptial, okay, uh, of, of all of that. That brings me then to the ketubah. The ketubah is exactly that. It is a marriage contract. The ketubah, the traditional ketubah, which I never ever recommend to a modern couple that I officiate their wedding, uh, is basically a statement of the worth of the bride as to whether she is a virgin or not. And it actually states mm -hmm. if she's a virgin, she's worth 400 shekels. If she's not a virgin, mm -hmm. she's worth 200 shekels. I have been told that in the Satmar, in the traditional Hasidic community to this very day, they actually still inspect after the after the um, first night when the couple is together, they actually inspect the sheet to make sure to see if there's blood on it. And if there's not blood, then that's grounds for divorce because it means she lied and she wasn't a virgin. But she says she was a virgin and she wasn't a virgin. Okay. So anyway, uh, it really, the ketubah is really a document of the worth of the bride in traditional Judaism. Hmm. In Reformed tradition, uh, it really, I say to couples, find the ketubah that is meaningful to you, that is beautiful to you, expressing your feelings and should be both in the Hebrew side as well as the English. Uh, and some of the more conservative rabbis accept uh, one where the Hebrew is this thing about the worth of the bride, but the English side is more of an expression of feelings and, and, and affirmation, can, uh, can, dedication of each to the other, okay? So, going back to your question, uh, is that who are the witnesses for the document? Traditional Judaism states very clearly the witnesses cannot be a mother, father, sister, or brother, or children for the ketubah. And why? Because none of their um, none of them are acceptable as witnesses in a court of Jewish law under any circumstance. So therefore, they cannot be. Also, in a traditional ketubah, no females can sign either because females are not also considered to be kosher witnesses in any situation at all, no less a ketubah. Um, so in, in my wedding ceremonies, which obviously are reform and modern, I, I will have either men or women sign, uh, but I try to dissuade simply a, a mother, father, sister, or brother from signing only because that's my thing about something of a tradition here. But does it make it un, you know, does it make that ketubah invalid? Well, in the, under the Orthodox, yes, because you're a woman also you sign. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if, but I was a, a sister-in-law. Sister-in-law was okay. So, I, it was okay. Yeah. Okay. Her sister would not be. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I'm obviously describing things in a very, very summary fashion. The, the laws to this and the Talmud, the mission of the other the further books on Jewish law are very, very complicated in all of these areas. So now we got this per this little baby was born, uh, was entered into Hebrew school, was bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, and got married. And we're going to end there today, except I will do something else. Since I have my tefillin with me today, I might as well do that. Okay. Well, what about confirmation? Oh, okay. yeah, I forgot about that. Um, in Reform Judaism, and is also brought in in, in conservative, uh, is, is that we said to ourselves, sadly enough, uh, how many of our kids bar mitzvah and we never see them again, or bat mitzvah. Correct. And certainly in traditional Judaism, there was no bat mitzvah to begin with. And even conservative Judaism, in its earlier years, there was no bat mitzvah really either. 
Uh, and so uh, we introduced confirmation, which was a way of keeping kids in for a year or two. So it's either the eighth, ninth grade or 10th grade, maybe three years uh, at the seventh grade, uh, which is when a child is usually 13, uh, and keeping them in Hebrew school and confirming their Judaism. So that they are bar, therefore bar and bat mitzvah is, I'm Jewish, I'm in an adolescent, and I'm going to give thanks to God for it by this torturous ceremony called bar and bat mitzvah. Okay. Whereas confirmation is, hopefully they're now a little bit more mature, uh, and they're able to confirm uh, voluntarily that I am going to live a Jewish way of life. Okay, but thanks for keeping me on the straight now. <laughs> okay, so... Going back to the bar mitzvah, actually, at the bar mitzvah, one of the main rituals that a child could perform, could do, is putting on tefillin, especially if it was a boy. In Reform and Conservative today, girls can also wear tefillin, and we had, well, Betty was one of our two females in my mm -hmm. tefillin class today. By the way, do, by the way, does anyone want some scotch? I'm already herring it, well, the herring is there, but I do have my bottle of Lachayim. Scotch, anyone want scotch? Are you moving for that? So, Happy so, hour. So schnapp is that, is that scotch? Lynn and Betty, that's how we can get more members here. Every day at about 4 o'clock, we're going to have Happy Hour at Temple Sinai. There you go. Happy yeah. Hour anyway. We may as well have the scotch too. Yeah. Yeah. Happy Hour. It's like it's, 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 it's a living facility. <laughs> and this pairing every Saturday. That's right. Happy yeah. 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 Hour. Temple Sinai. Yeah. Okay, great. I think it's the next one. Okay. Now. Uh, every day. My tefillin is in the bag. This is a Halloween. Now, um, these two things go together. On Shabbat and on the holidays of the year, which we already looked at, uh, is, is that those days are holy unto themselves. Even if we were not to mark them as holy, and God looks to us as human beings to bring holiness into this world that we live in, into this world of Asiya, this uh, lowest of all the worlds from the highest spiritual realms. We are the ones to bring spirituality and God's presence in. However, on Shabbat and the holidays, whether we ever do anything at all, those days are holy unto themselves. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the week, where everything okay? On the rest of the week, when we wake up in the morning, most of us, the least thing we're thinking about is God. Okay? However, there are many, many rituals and ceremonies to kind of charge us up in the morning. So during the morning time, we can, of course, the tradition is uh, to wear a tali. It's actually, uh, Hannah, do me a favor. Turn around up there, and uh, on the two shelves up, you see those blue books? And Lynn, you already have that one in your hand? This one? Yeah, the small ones. Can I have, bring them all out. Not the big one, it's harder. This do it, yeah, don't hurt yourself. Do it completely. I'm going to give them out. Okay, How many Betty? more do you want? All of them. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Here, let me Oh, it's some open the back, some are Hebrew opening, some are not Hebrew opening. Yeah, some are Hebrew opening, some are not Hebrew opening. Yeah, these reformed Jews, they can't. Okay. Okay, page 48, 48. In the Kabbalah, in Jewish mysticism, it says that God wanted to create existence, but everything was God. And so what God needed to do was contract itself, allowing there to be other than God. And so every morning when we get up, as we put a talit on, we are wrapping ourselves to bring our energy inside in order to, as the day progresses, to move that energy outside. So notice there's a prayer on the top of this page. <clears throat> Sorry, down. Blessed is the Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who hallows us with his mitzvot and teaches us to wrap ourselves in the fringe talit, the fringe garment. 
So there, that's the prayer that would be said. And there are many versions of the Talit uh, and the knots and windings on them. But it says in the book of Numbers that as we look at the fringes, we are to be reminded of God because the number of knots and windings on each fringe, the four of them, north, south, east, west, representing the idea that God is everywhere, uh, is these fringes, uh, these numbers, the knots and windings, <clears throat> are to indicate that God is one because they're equivalent to the Hebrew letters Adonai, who Echad, God is one. So as we look at this, we think of the oneness of God. There are actually 36 different versions of putting the, making these knots and windings. And uh, I said this this morning, uh, that there was one supposedly Jewish mystic who actually wore 36 taluses mm -hmm. at the same time, since no one's really sure which is the correct one. And actually, mm -hmm. might, maybe there was a 37th and he just missed out. Who knows? <laughs> okay, now. There, from this, then, remember the prayer, the Yahafta prayer, and it says, and you shall bind, you shall love the Lord your God, we're all familiar with the prayer, and you shall bind it upon the, your, you shall make a sign upon your arm, and you shall have a symbol between your eyes, the various translations of this. The question is, the rabbis looked at these words from scripture, and remember scripture, of course, is divinely written, inspired. What in the world does that mean? There are many cultures where they will tattoo the names of God on their bodies, and therefore they would be able to be reminded of God as they look at their body. Well, we are not, we don't believe in tattoos. So the rabbi said, what do we do with this? So really, and um, I'm going to say it's almost like genius that they could think of this, is that they developed the filling, which is comprised of two boxes. The tefillin is only put on in the daily morning service and during the week only. And uh, have you all seen this? You all seen this? Okay. Yeah, you showed us last week. I did? Yeah. I, oh, those are the boxes. Oh, I did this whole thing, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't mind seeing it. We'll see yeah. them. Boy, do you remember this one? I would too. Okay, good. So oh, let me ask you. Oh, I forgot about that. All right, sorry about that. I was Okay, sorry. This one was nice. Okay. Okay. Eight. I don't know who's on screen, Rabbi. Oh, yeah, the one person still on. Okay, so you have it to fill in here on the left arm. If you're a righty, you have to wear the, the if you're a lefty, rather, then you have to put the fill on your right arm. But it's a different color. Well, it's only different because this notch here, this piece of leather here, is face has to face toward the heart. So obviously, if you put it on the other side, it has to be reversed. And it's wrapped around the forearm seven times. One, two. And then there's a another box here on the head. And this idea is to govern our thoughts, obviously, and our actions in fulfilling the mitzvot. Now, in Reform Judaism, as I said before, and Betty wore one today, and also Marshall is here, Marshall Alphabet, uh, is that a female can wear. Uh, in Orthodox Judaism, a female could wear, but she's exempt from doing this, so she doesn't have to do this. So the tradition is women, females basically don't, but they could. And that's wrapped around three times around the pointer finger, or whatever thing you want to call that. Sounds like women have gotten a bad rap all through history. Especially, they have, but we love you anyway. <laughs> okay. and it goes like this. Actually, in an Orthodox community, men in reality, there's an appearance of a woman wearing tefillin, she's likely to be stoned. Well, yeah, very sweet. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, they do it. You have to you can't walk on the same side of the street as them. Mm -hmm. the, one, the one good thing that I remember from the Bible is that, remember when it said a woman couldn't have property and they went right. to the elders? Moses. And Moses, mm -hmm. yeah, and Moses said they shouldn't get property. Mm -hmm. So they were recognized as, as having the whole property. I yeah. thought that was Interesting, oh, yeah. in the middle of everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, last week, actually, last week when I showed this too, is it last week? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, boy. You're sleeping. It's been right. a long day. You started It's 9 o'clock yeah. this morning. I started your day. Yeah. Keep on teaching. And actually, I have here four sets of film. Okay. Uh, the They actually have, archaeologists have actually uncovered sets of film from the first and second centuries, which is 2,000 years ago. 
So we know that this is a genuine ritual that's been used by Jews for thousands of years, mm -hmm. which I think is totally amazing and very cool. Okay. But <clears throat> and there were but there are various versions and variations on what goes into the boxes. On the box and the arm, there's one piece of parchment upon which are written the Shema, the Yahapta, and two other paragraphs. Let's call them one, two, three, four. In the head to fill in, there are the same four paragraphs, Shema Viyat and two others, but they are written on four separate pieces of parchment. The parchment, by the way, it's animal skin, it is fetus skin. Whereas the Torah is used for complete uh, calf skin, full sheets, is that for a, a top, you can imagine how tiny these things are, and there are smaller boxes as you can obtain also. This is fetus skin. Ew. Okay, anyway, leave aside that part. Just being able to slide that. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That's, so anyway, it was basically codified or set in a certain ritual way as to how these paragraphs would be set up by Rashi, who was the great uh, French commentator to the Torah and to other books of Jewish tradition in the 11th century. But it was that his grandson, whose name was Rubenu Tam, <clears throat> now, Rabbeinu Tom, <clears throat> his grandson, obviously, was a great rabbi also. He's in the family. Okay. <clears throat> and his grandson said to him, Grandpa, I disagree with you. The, in the four parts, pieces, the parchments up here, it's not going to be one, two, three, four. The order is going to be one, two, four, three. So, there is another tradition of wearing the tefillin of Rabbeinu Tom. In this tefillin, uh, the four pack pieces of parchment are in a different order than this tefillin. Okay. <clears throat> there are people, including me, <clears throat> uh, who wear both the pairs of tefillin at the same time. When I wake up in the morning, I put the two head pieces on the Rabbeinu Tom, since the acceptable one in order to fulfill the mitzvah of tefillin is to follow Rashi's designation of the paragraphs is, is that this one goes is supposed to be a symbol before your eyes so this box goes further forward and then behind I have then the one of Rabbeinu Tom. Later on in my morning davening, my morning praying, I'll take this strap off and put on the strap that's in here of Rabbeinu Tom as grandsons. But the one in the arm doesn't really matter because it's still only one piece of parchment. Mm -hmm. The head piece is the one that's critical. Now, to complicate things, or to make them more interesting, depending upon how you look at it, there was a rabbi, Abraham ben David, I don't remember, he was in the Middle Ages also, and he said <clears throat> the following, who is the tefillin being worn for? Is it being worn for the davener, the prayer person, or for God? So hmm. he then developed another box of tefillin for the head only, there's no arm, in which the parchments are in the mirror image of the one in my head. Okay? And then there was, a, a, by the way, a mirror image of Rabbeinu Tom's tefillin. But there was another rabbi called the Shemura Rabba, who then also developed another set of the mirror image of Rashi's to fill in. So rather than pointing outward toward God, it's pointing backward toward the person who's praying. You see, there's a really big box. That's really big. So I'll have you And it's really, and there's parchment in there. It's very heavy wood. Yeah. So there are, there are four different kinds of to fill in. Now you might say, boy, these rabbis had too much time in their hands. Yeah, right. right. But to realize how serious all of these things obviously are, to do the rituals properly, whatever that means, and as you can see, which is the proper way? What is? It becomes one, a combination of what is acceptable within the, the community in which you live in. Okay? On the other hand, it is also ultimately what, if you do believe that what you do actually will affect God itself, 
then it does matter what you do and how you do it. So, the, the feeling that were identified archaeologically were before Rossi. Yeah, a lot, a lot of years. before Rossi. About, yeah. So, what has been determined about the headpieces in those early? Uh, according to the thing I read today, and, and Greg read, read for that morning mm -hmm. experience. Uh, was that there's a lot of um, they sort of simply everyone's to fill it was different mm. based upon who who is that scribe oh. yeah well and let me see okay let things here I have open I uh, I'll just tell you a, a story I t I told the group this morning that he didn't hear it though because she was uh, banished so to speak <laughs> no not really no she had something to do with Lynn uh so anyway I uh, is is that I didn't know when I grew up as, as a reform community. I knew I didn't even heard of these things. I knew nothing about it because my rabbi was a classical reform rabbi, uh, and uh, we didn't. I even I even I had no idea what these things were until I got to Hebrew Union College, the medical school, and I learned about it. And so I've been putting on tefillin every morning uh, for the last almost fifty years. And there's no place that we go to in the world at all in which I don't take my tefillin with me. Tefillin. But sometime during my rabbinical school period, and I don't really know how I did this. It's really bizarre how certain things happened to me or I, whatever. Is that I ended up visiting a very great modern rabbi whose name was um, Zalman Shachter. Zalman Shachter was the founder of the Jewish Renewal Movement. If any of you are familiar with it, there are quite a few rabbis down here in South Florida who um, have been ordained and, and learned in it. It is basically... Um, Judaism with mysticism and Zen Buddhism, okay, and meditation and, and dancing and drums, and it's a, it really meets the spiritual needs of people who want to go beyond simply what a normal, regular congregation can give. So anyway, I and, tr and truthfully, I don't remember how I ended up there, but I spent the day with him in his home in Germantown, Pennsylvania, one just the two of us for an entire day. And when I left there, I remembered that he had two pairs of tefillin on his head. I had already been using one pair, the Rashi. And I probably should have called him up and said, how do you do that? How do you put two pairs of tefillin on your head? But that's not me. <laughs> I figured out, oh, yeah, I know how to do that. So I went down to Lower East Side. I bought a second, the Rabbeinu Tom tefillin. And I put both box, I took off the mm -hmm. strap and I put both boxes side by side on my head. Mm -hmm. And for years, that's why Dobbin every morning did that. It was comfortable, fine. <clears throat> and then one of our trips to Israel with the temple up there, up north, uh, there's actually a place in the Pardo in the old city, uh, which I think is still there, uh, in which they will uh, check you to fill in while you wait. And the strap was getting a little worn out. And you can replace the straps anytime. So <clears throat> I went into the shop. And the, 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 the wife of the owner of the shop and the, and the guy who does the tefillin repair, because women cannot touch the tefillin, uh, is, is that um, I, I gave the tefillin. <clears throat> and uh, she looked at them, and especially the two boxes side by side. And she said to me, what is this? Where'd you learn this? And I wasn't lying to her. I said, my, I saw my teacher have it this way. Well, he did really. He had two boxes on, but not this way exactly, but it was like a half, whatever. So she said, well, um, well, anyway, come back tomorrow. I can't do it while you're late. My husband's busy with stuff. Come back tomorrow. So I came back the next day, and she said to me, and he didn't come out. And she he, she came out and said, oh, here's your tefillin, but I can't give it back to you the way that you gave it to me because the way you gave it to me is forbidden. And because you cannot deviate from the tradition. Mm -hmm. And then she said to me that actually when my husband saw your tefillin, the way it was set up, he actually started shaking because he was concerned that you might have affected and infected the spiritual stability of the holy city by what you brought into it. Oh my God. <laughs> So she said, so I only can give it to you the correct way. So I said to myself silently, thank God, good. Okay. <laughs> and 
Uh, and anyway, the the the, the, the Rashi, the Rabbeinu Tam, is on a separate strap and goes further back, and that's how, and that's the way you're supposed to do it. Well, how did she tell you that? Yeah, she gave me the, she gave it to me properly and said this is the way it's supposed to be. I said thank you, I'm very glad, and and I left bad quickly. Angel, the bad <laughs> angels could have in. Inflamed the mm -hmm. whole right, oh, oh, exactly. and all based upon mm -hmm. little old me. Little old me. Okay. So the Power. question then: So why do I share this with you? First of all, it's an interesting story. I think it's really mm -hmm. cool. The, but mm -hmm. the fact is, you could say that's Boba Mice, so that's ridiculous. Okay, mm -hmm. but in the the traditional world, and if you take these rituals seriously, any and the spiritual world. Anything is possible. Okay, that's number one. So you might say, well, you, know, you might say to Steve or Rabbi, whatever you want to call me, but whatever it is, you may say, well, weren't you concerned about what you had done? <laughs> and no. <laughs> because my feeling was, you know something, God was probably very happy the fact that I even learned about two to fill and spent a day with Reb Shalman, Zalman. And the other thing is, guess what? God knows that I'm sincere. And the fact is, is I wasn't doing anything intentionally. Yeah, sure, I probably should have found another rabbi and asked them, how do you do this thing? But the fact is, is that we as Reformed Jews are in a very special place because we can take the traditions and we can mold them to ourselves. And even if we kind of mess up with things, guess what? If your heart is in the right place, that's what God really wants. Your intention. Because of, right. right. It's the your intention. Is the, the effort is there. The effort is there. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so, therefore, I want to share this with you because it's a part of the fulfilling experience here and to show you. Um, but how interesting that experience was. I mean, this is now probably 30 years ago, and I've never forgotten it. Obviously, why would Good I? Thing you weren't awfully sensitive. You could have gone up to the wall and thrown yourself off. Yeah, th yeah, thanks, Hank. I know, but that really I never thought. Great idea. <laughs> I can just see it now. Oh, what did yeah. I do? Yeah, but I wouldn't be here, so that wouldn't have worked out. Oh, yeah. So anyway, ladies, 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 mm -hmm. uh, thank you for listening today. So we are off next week, <clears throat> and then obviously the chapters in the book are funeral customs and life after death. So after after what you gave us, just keep reading? Yeah, You're, just been talking. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, January 4th, oh, is that? Yeah, it oh. is. Oh, oh, yeah, I do. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. Yeah. I don't know where I am. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry, ladies. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be the 4th, yeah, the weeks. 11th and the 18th, I guess, instead of the... Yeah, I'm sorry, we, not, we can't have class this 4th. All right. The 11th, the 11th of January. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, no, I don't have you. What am I talking about? There you know. Sorry. Okay. So the next one is. Have to be January 11th. Yeah. The 11th. Yeah. And January then. January 11th. It's actually. actually. Okay, everyone, have a lovely evening. Uh, what? what? And 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 no, 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 no class of December. Yeah, no class the 28th or the 4th. Four. Right. Back on the 11th. Right. I'll send out another email. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it would be. And, and the 28th of December. Number, right. Everybody can wear No oh, class. Yeah. Okay. So the next time we meet is the 11th. Right. Okay. And also you can read section 4, which is illness, death, and mourning, uh, pages 54, 55 to 76. Do me a favor, repeat Wait. the reading yeah. one more. Somebody Wait, repeat the reading. Uh, section 4 of the book. Oh, the whole section. You have it? Okay. Yeah, I have it. But Betty, uh, is, uh, when is the uh, next uh, board meeting? Is the 26th? 26th, right? Yes. Okay, that's what I get. One was. Okay, let me put these back. I can put these back. What's the illness? Yeah. Oh, I want to do that. Okay. Illness. The section is illness, death, and mourning. So that's 55. Sounds like a job. <laughs> so what do you think about and the then, fact that we put the uh, the Abuse. box in the same place where it's the seat of learning, the cha six chakra, and all that. I think it's interesting. It's all related. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I think I may get that book in the mail today or tomorrow, so I'll bring this back. Okay, good, great. No problem. I'm sure. Um, you have another one? Oh, no, I don't have it. No, that was just my hand. Was that? January 4th. Yeah, don't go. Does that go up here? Yes, it does. I just want to see if I can identify the handwriting. Oh. Eleventh and eighteenth. Yeah, I'm gonna keep this one. I knew okay. was, whose it was. The others are back. I'm keeping this one. You're gonna remind me, huh? Later. I'm just telling you. Good for you. Okay. I I don't know. This one is okay. what no, you need. Okay. I don't like them. All right. Well, I opened it. I opened it. Oh, I have to I have you want to tell? It's so in the world, yeah. but that's so, what it yeah. it's well, you want to do whatever. Exactly. Yes. Well, well, I don't know if you want to do it. It's yeah. not too long. I don't think. Oh, Sharon, yeah. oh my God. Oh, that's what it is. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. But I'm not going to give the way. Wow. Wow. All right, let me. I'm having words. I had seen that in my eyes. Okay, wait. Yes. Well, I don't. Okay. Because I know she was going to see her daughter. Mm -hmm.